from Seco Future Farm. Today's innovations, tomorrow's solutions. Good morning and uh, welcome back to Future Farm. Uh, we're in the soybeans, as you can see, uh, this time around. Jim, tell me why we're standing in soybeans this time of year. Yeah, that's a great question, Rob, and thank you for hosting this episode. Ah, a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, so you know, here we are, early June, almost mid-June, and we've gotten a lot of rain here the last couple of weeks. You know, through the end of May and the first part of June, a lot of rain has come through, and now different things are starting to show up in, in fields, and especially in soybean fields right now. So today we're going to be talking a lot about soybean seedling diseases. Okay. So what are the common soybean seedling diseases, Jim? They all kind of bunch together under different forms of root rot. And so we have different pathogens or different diseases that cause these okay. types of root rots. And they're all fungi or fungal-like organisms. And so we have Phytophthora, we have Pythium, Rhizoctonia, and then just a litany of different Fusarium fungi that will cause these diseases. Well, I mean, what are the uh, what are the environmental conditions that would promote these? Uh, seeing more of these than normal. Yeah. So, like I mentioned, we got we have gotten a lot of rain, and you know, every field is a very diverse set of environments within a single field, and so everybody can picture those spots and fields that may hold a little bit more water than elsewhere in the field. So that might either be due to a low spot in the field where water accumulates in, and we'll just stand there for a while. It could be a compacted part of the field where you, you take your trucks and you drive into the field, the entrance or exits. Uh, it could also just be a field that, that isn't tiled and needs to be patterned tiled in order to get rid of more of that moisture. You know, this can be caused by a number of different things, whether it's soil type, you know, so tight clays tend to hold more water than sandy soils do. It could be a higher water table, and therefore, when, anytime we get a rain, that water table raises up and just holds water longer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, temperature plays a major role in this too. You know, we can picture that soybean plants like corn grow within a range of temperatures. And so let's call that, you know, somewhere between the 50 and, and 85 degrees or so. Uh, and as soybeans are growing within those temperatures, you also have pathogens that grow in those temperatures and outside of those temperatures. So if we're too cold, we're gonna see more uh, pathogenic activity, so they're gonna grow when the soybean's not growing. Same thing when it happens when we're too hot. A lot of uh, fusariums and other uh, fungi will take over when things get too warm as well. And ultimately what that results in is stunted plants that look like they're dying at this time of year. You know, we have uh, soybeans that are ankle high to mid shin. In some parts of the country, we have some knee high beans and you'll see spots in the field where the soybean plants might not even be over the top of your boot. And so I have a couple of examples of plants here. And so you can pretty quickly recognize them in the field. And these plants would be, you know, in a field where we have shin high uh, plants, these are no taller than the top of my boot, three, four inches off the ground. And that's where water had accumulated okay. and these pathogens took over. So Jim, how do we treat these diseases? Yeah, so there are a number of different ways in order to get ahead of or avoid these situations altogether. You know, with the, any of these fungal diseases that attack the roots, you know, once you see it, it's already too late for those plants. There's no real rescue to these diseases. And so we have to think about prior to planting what we can do. So the first things first is field management. You know, are there ways that we can get water out of that field more quickly than, than other ways? So tiling a field that's not otherwise tiled, uh, reducing compaction in the field, things of that nature help move water out of the field quicker than what you would normally uh, get without doing those practices. Second option, and uh, something that you should use cohesively as an integrated management strategy, would be varietal selection. And so a number of these diseases are actually rated for within our characteristics chart within Rob Seco. So we give ratings for Phytophthora root rot. And so how good is a variety in being able to tolerate Phytophthora in the field? And this can be assisted by Phytophthora root rot genes. So these are the RPS genes. You have the RPS one and three would be the most prevalent ones. You have 3A, you have 1K, whatever they might be. Uh, that help out in terms of specific Phytophthora species. And then there's also seed treatments that help out a lot in these diseases as well. And so that would be your third line of defense is using a seed treatment that would be specific for different diseases. So for Phytophthora, you have uh, things like metalaxyl and you've got uh, Picarbutrazox and 
Then for rhizoctonia, sedaxane is a great uh, active ingredient that's present in our Fortify seed treatment that helps out with these as well. And then for a lot of fusariums, if you're looking at products that help control sudden death syndrome, those will typically be helpful for uh, several fusarium species too. So Jim, are there any planter box treatments that might help in this area as well? That is a great question. So that would be the last line of defense when you're not looking at field management, varietal selection, or on seed seed treatment. You can come in with a set of planter box solutions that help with uh, these uh, diseases. And so we have a planter box solution that contains metal axle. Metal axle has an impact on some of these diseases, as well as a biofungicide that called First Defense that we use in order to assist the metal axle and provide additional protection and suppression of uh, especially fusarium fungi. So if, if not treated properly, what is the potential impact of these diseases on, mm -hmm. on the crop? Yeah, so it, it can range from being extremely minor. So you can picture those fields that are well-drained, well-managed, where you only have little pockets in the field that uh, you may not even be able to measure with the yield monitor, uh, the, what the yield impact may be. Mm -hmm. So it can be anywhere from, you know, tenths of a bushel uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, dramatic changes that may be, you know, up to 30, 40% of a field's, uh, you know, yield potential. We have seen some areas in southern Iowa in particular and, and other parts of the country where there's such high pythium pressure that we may get a final stand in soybeans without any sort of management activities mm -hmm. of 30,000 plants per acre when we planted it at 165 or 180,000 seeds per acre. Now, if you add in P. carbutrazox, so that would be present in our Fortify seed treatment, we've been able to see increases in that final plant establishment from 35,000 plants per acre up to over 90,000 plants per acre, which gives a substantial increase in the yield potential for that field. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're looking for maybe on those fields, you're maybe looking for 50 bushels an acre, you could be down sub 30 bushels an acre without management activities and get yourself back up to the 50 bushels an acre level. Yeah, it's significant. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when I was uh, early in my career, I was our soybean product manager back in the early 80s, and I remember what the fields looked like. Soybean seed treatments hadn't been adopted yet, mm -hmm. and you would walk out in fields and the whole parts of the field uh, would, there'd be no, pl no living plants. Mm -hmm. And so we made a lot of progress progress um, in, in that area, haven't we? Oh, absolutely. The combination of seed treatments and varietal selection for improved disease resistance has made a dramatic difference. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. You know, I think another, another part of this is that with earlier planting, uh, it puts more pressure on seed quality and, and seed treatments, having some solutions out there for disease. Is that correct, Jim? Oh, that's absolutely the case. I mean, the earlier we plant that seed in the field, the earlier access those fungi have to the seed in order to start the infection. And we've all seen in those early plantings that beans may not take off right away. You know, you may have a week, two weeks, some cases three weeks if we get a really cold snap where the, the beans just don't do much during that period. Yeah. And so the better we can do in treating those beans and protecting them against those fungi, the better off we'll be. And then those early planting dates will have the full potential to result in the highest yields possible. Well, we know that pl early planting with soybeans brings higher yields. Mm -hmm. We know that, but it also brings more risk in this area. So your, your comments about uh, treatment and amendments in the planter box, things like that being more important is, is more true now than, than ever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So tell me, I mean, what is a threshold, if we have a problem in a field and we see a reduced stand, what is a threshold uh, d for the decision to replant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So you've already made all your decisions on uh, varietal selection, seed treatments and everything, but now you've noticed that maybe we just couldn't stay enough ahead of it and we have a reduced sand. And so it might not be the entire field, so you need to look within zones of the field to make the decisions off of. And so what I usually go off of is that uh, both the stand establishment, uh, which would be a combination of how many plants per acre and how uniform that stand establish might, establishment might be within that area, and the planting date. The later the planting date, the, uh, the later the potential replant date, I should say, mm -hmm. the lower your yield potential will be. And so a combination of those two things, if you're looking at sub 90,000 plants per acre and you're still in the month of May, especially the first half of May, then absolutely replanting is probably the best decision. Once you start getting into late May and into June, you start looking at it and saying, well, 
is weed control going to be an issue if I don't replant? And if I do replant, I probably still need to make another herbicide a a application. But also, my yield potential is dropping down to 70, 60% of what the total yield potential for the field might be. And so using that kind of math to determine is that a worthwhile investment is absolutely critical. My, my typical rule of thumb is once you're replanting soybeans after June 10th, you're more than likely better off not replanting and using the established sand you have okay. unless you have a fully drowned out part of the field. So June 10th is a, cut, a significant cutoff date. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. So we've talked about common soybean diseases. We talked about why early planting is necessary for better yields, but also brings on the incidence of of disease Mm -hmm. uh, because of cool and wet conditions. We've talked about the importance of seed treatment, the importance of varietal selection, Mm because there are significant differences in varieties, and then planter box amendments we can add to that to help control these diseases so you can reach the full yield potential of your crop. And uh, so I think we've covered these in, in uh, pretty uh, in great detail today, haven't we, Jim? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. Ah, uh, pleasure. It's been fun. Mm-hmm.